to make these changes yourself and also see the impact of this. So the sample comes with some benchmarks built in. So as you optimize, you're going to see the numbers improve. And then for, for some of the exercises in this workshop, you will also use a separate tracker that I'm going to walk you through, where you can actually put in your numbers and then as a group, we will see how much improvement we got. Alright, so, okay, let me move on. So this is the slide that we have been looking at till now. Uh, so what I want you folks to do is open the first link, uh, which is tinyurl.com slash shop workshop. And it's going to take you to this uh, drive folder where you will have three documents. The first one is the slides that I'm going to be using. The second one is where you will find all the links. So what you need to do is you need to install Expo Go on your device. Uh, the app is, I think, called Expo. Uh, if you have an Android device, use that. But if you don't, if you have an iOS one, you can use that as well. It's just that you're not going to see that big of an increase because if your device is very fast, you're already running at max performance, then you will not see the gains. In that case, you can just refer to the device that I will have connected with my laptop, which is a very low end Android device. Um, and once you have Expo Go, you go and open this link on your laptop, which is going to create an instance for you.
Having any trouble? Oh, yeah, you can't get to the tiny URL link. Yeah, you can't get to the tiny URL link. Tell that. What's going on? Oh, it's just being blocked by my security. Oh.
one more thing, if at any point you get stuck on any of the exercises, if you go back to your important links document, you would see that you have direct links to skip ahead. So let's say if you were not able to finish task three and you want to like just start from task four, you can just open a new snack which would have task three already completed in it. So you would be able to skip in case you get stuck. Um, the links are also there in the results sheet, uh, but only from task five onwards. All right, we can get started then. I'm going to walk you folks through what the sample is and uh, what aspects of it are you going to look at. So this is a list of tweets. Uh, they are not real tweets, so just you might have, you might see some familiar names, but uh, I don't know if they are real tweets or not, they are just uh, something that exists. So you, you see it says tweet page zero on the top, so if I tap any of these tweets, it's going to navigate to the same page again. Uh, but it will say tweet page one on the top. So this is a specific area where we are going to try and figure, try and improve the load time of the second page. Right? Like right now it's very slow, it's a slow device, it's taking over a second. So we'll see how we can make it faster by using some very simple tricks. Uh, and then, uh, there's a run benchmark button on the top. What that does is we're gonna use that from task five onwards, but if I tap that, the app is gonna try and scroll itself automatically and it's going to compute some numbers behind the scenes. Uh, and once this whole run is, you can see how badly it's performing right now, So, but it's gonna try and go back to the top and it's going to give us a result. So it's saying that our DSSPS was 0 0.9 uh, average, minimum 0 0.3, maximum 6. Uh, so we, we just let me not work in this channel. Yeah. So this is something that we are going to work on. And then you have few of these tweets have a recommendations row which says related to and it's a list of the same tweets, but the idea is to mix a vertical list with a horizontal list, which is quite expensive to render. If I tap on one of those uh, tweets, it's going to change the primary tweet list, basically. If I tap on this, the tweet uh, next to it or hosting this recommended list changes. So if I tap on Connor's tweet, it's gonna change the one over here. So the idea is that you need now a state at your list item to be able to incorporate that thing. And that causes some problems when you have lists in your app. So we are going to also look at how to solve that. That's it. That's the sample. Um, so um, let's move on. Let's see what happens next. All right. So let's observe the measurements that have already been set up and you're going to observe this in your expose snack on your laptop. All right. I'm going to show you how. So what I have done is we have um, a marker view set up in our code. I'm going to quickly also tell you what, uh, what all we have in the sample. So if you go to the SRC folder, you would see there's folder called Twitter, and there are three main components here. Twitter, which is essentially the whole screen, which is uh, hosting a flat list, which is showing all these tweets, uh, and this flat list renders tweet cells, which is every individual tweet. Uh, and the function of tweet cell is to basically display tweet content and the horizontal list. So if you, I quickly show you um, the JSX part. If you notice, uh, there's a tweet content being displayed. Line number 
39 there is a tweet content and then on line number 53 there is another flat list which is uh, rendering that horizontal list. But the horizontal list is only shown if the tweet has been retweeted more than two times. So it's these details are not important uh, when we go through the exercises but just so you know those are the rules. And then tweet content is basically the entire tweet, how it looks like, image, text, everything like that. So these are the three main components that we are going to be working with. Uh, there's a special hook also involved, which I'll talk about later. Alright. So, if you look at on the bottom left, there is something that, there's a text label that says no errors, one warning. You can click on that and you would get access to the logs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap one of the tweet and you will see a timestamp show up which is going to tell us the amount of time that the screen took to load. Right. It took 16.31 milliseconds. Right. Uh, so you should be able to do the same on your Expo instance and you should be able to see the time that it's taking on your device. If you have a fast device, it should be really low. If you have a slow device, well, it should be higher. Right? I doubt if anyone's time will be higher than mine because I'm using a Moto G, which is pretty low end device. This is what I use every day, so it's too hard to be problem.
sure that I have the latest code. I will also just put a log and reload. So sometimes it doesn't reload, so I tend to be a bit careful about it. seconds. Let's try that again. Sometimes it varies. So it's like 1.5 seconds now. Uh, you can try that on your own devices and you would see the same difference. So our times went down from 2.5 seconds to 1.5 seconds by just specifying this one small processing time. Ideally you would not want to do it this way. You would because your app can run on a tablet, it can run on you know various screen sizes, various DPI configurations. You would want to come up with some sort of height estimation for your item, and then use the screen height and figure out what the initial num to render should be. Uh, and it's going to be consistently be around 1.5. I can try that again. If they are a premium user, I'm going to show 
special text uh, in the header called is premium. It's changing the burden to make sure I have the address code and I will hit the reload button and then go back. Okay. So let me show you what the hook does. So I'm, I'm trying to simulate a scenario where you have feature flags in your code base or a certain experiment. So what, what's happening here is once the page is loaded, we are calling a bunch of modules, figure out whether the user is, let's say, has is in experiment one, two, three. If, if they are in all the four experiments, then they are a premium user. And usually, when you have feature flags, you call a native module. Uh, and in the response of that native module, you end up calling set state. So in this particular hook, what's happening is if, if the user is in all the four experiments, then they are considered a premium user. Uh, and this is that's what this hook returns. So I'm of course not making an actual native module call. What I'm doing is in the use effect, I'm using a small timeout, which is 50 milliseconds. And once that resolves, I just end up calling true for all the experiments, and which is gonna uh, lead to my, uh, like if you look at the run benchmark button uh, on the top of the page, it says premium on the right. So you can actually go ahead and do the same. Uh, just go to Twitter, uh, uncomment line 29, and then line number 47 save and reload and you will see this premium text being shown on the header. And you will also see your logs have a timer which is computing how much time it takes for that premium text to show on the screen. Right. So your page loads and then these bunch of set states happen to show this premium text and we are computing the time it takes uh, from the point where the initial render happened to the point this text is visible, so which is close to four seconds. I'm not going to use this one. I'm going to open a fresh instance and take that time, and then we are going to see how we can improve that number. All right. Stable underscore batch update. 
different states that you call within this uh, scope as batch by default. What that means is it's going to come up with the final state first and then trigger one of it instead of triggering four of it. So we'll see how what it does to the time. Again, it's a, it's a, like you can use this change uh, like in your certain specific hooks, for example, if you use things like use query, right, and you have more than a few queries to load one page, each of those queries might lead to individual updates, uh, especially if, you know, your data is cached, right? In that case, in one frame, everything is available from cache, but you're still doing multiple updates. So in those cases, this can be very really helpful. So let's uh, I'm gonna change my version again just to be sure that I have the latest code. And we are gonna save and reload and see what happens. So it was taking about 1.6 seconds. And let's reload. tool uh, selectively or you can deploy it globally right one of the changes that I shipped recently yeah go ahead uh, sorry I didn't really interrupt you no worries um, but would it be the same effect if we took all four different state variables and put them into like one object and just updated all of them in the set at the same time yes uh, but what I'm trying to simulate is that these feature flags, let's say if they exist on the native side, right? Like if you have a storage library, which is async, then you would more often than not access them individually and they would resolve a promise and that promise would can only do like one set state. Uh -huh. Or you would have to come up with a batching logic of your own, right? But that's not typically how you code in React. You usually have abstractions like you use feature flag and you give it a feature flag and it gives you a response back. That's how most of us write abstractions, but they lead to a lot of repeated set states. One thing for you to verify whether you have this problem in your app or not is basically go to DevTools, uh, take a plain graph, and just see how many commits does your app require to finish the first thing on the screen, right? Like if it's, if it's a number, for example, for mobile admin on some of the pages, the number was almost 47. And that was because of these set states, which were mostly originating from native modules. Right? We were accessing something and then it would get resolved and in the promise we do a set state. But if the components were not memoized correctly, that set state happened to be very expensive. So once we deployed this change, our total commit count dropped to around nine for rendering one from like 40s, 50s to 9s, so and that led to an improvement of about 30 percent. So it depends, there are other solutions, we can do it, but what we wanted was to just eliminate the problem globally, which is where this is very useful. Uh, yeah, like you can use it in the way you want to, right? All right, so that was unstable batch updates. Again, very, very powerful technique. This is going to become default in React 18. And if you use web, React 18 already has batching enabled by default. However, in React Native, you, you will not get batching unless you are on the new architecture. So this is like a good stopgap solution. If you are on the old architecture, you can uh, use this API. All right, so that was 
premium. Uh, any questions? Or anyone who has not been able to do it on their own? You have to just comment out line number 29 and line number 46. Say a reload and you will see your, uh, the premium flag show up and then in the book you can wrap uh, all the set sets in this problem. Sell almost 45 of them, 35. 35 to each cells are entering. Right? <laughs> to us, we were 100. Just on now. By the way, this is because of Flatlist, because Flatlist uses an incredibly high uh, window size by default. It's around 21, which means it actually draws 10 screen worth of as long as you have data. And that's why you have so many tweet cell components even now. But anyways, that's irrelevant. What I'm gonna do now is I will tap uh, on one of the tweets and move to the other page. And let's see if we see any tweet cell components with focus spots. Okay. All right, 31. Re-rendering may not happen 
at the same exact point when your age is entering, so your load time may not be impacted, but you might be doing certain things, async, like the premium flag that we did before this, right? So all this work will actually interfere with what's visible on the screen. So you don't want this to happen. There could be multiple solutions, again, how you can like tackle this problem. What we have done at Shopify is we, we have a screen component that wraps everything that's rendered. Um, and this screen, when it goes into the background, it by default cuts off any updates to the page, generally. But in this particular case, what we can simply do is um, you can uh, just memoize tweaks it because it's not memoized right now. Right? Uh, but you need to know what's happening before you can decide what you want to do. Uh, I advocate for generic solutions because they eliminate the problem twice, but in a lot of cases it might not be viable for you to do that. So in this particular sample, let's just go to tweet cell. And we can simply, on line number 100, say react.memo. Uh, I need the version again, just to make sure. I'm going to read the version. How many of you actively memoize every component that you're writing? <laughs> yeah. So that's the point, right? Like we don't memoize everything. And imagine right now it's just one screen in this example. You might have five screens in your back stack, right? And if they are all updating, That's why I like just cut all of them out generically by having some kind of common wrapper, which we have this uh, hook called use is focus from React navigation. You can use it to just uh, cache the previous content and just render that every time you get a call query from here. In this case, we're just memoizing, but that could be a good way to be for you to adjudicate it generically. So let's try it. I'm gonna tap the screen again and I shouldn't see anything there. Oh, I'm still seeing pause. Okay, that's disappointing. Uh, let me maybe I have the wrong version. Problem is, uh, I have been passing a prop to basically demonstrate the focus state when it is probably being rendered. But ideally, in a real world application, you wouldn't need that. Uh, so, this needs to go. But this effectively impacts the demonstration a little bit because I'm not. Uh, oh, let's try this. We will, uh, instead of doing it this way, can use the same hook inside Twitter. I think that should be able to take this out. Oh no, 
getting about 35 extra renders, uh, which should have disappeared now. It might be a little difficult to observe, but you get the idea, right? Like once I have memorized who itself and I'm not passing any props that are changing every time, uh, these components are essentially not going to be rendered. So you will save a lot of time uh, that way. Okay. far fewer updates to to each cell focus. Uh, it's about 30 which is just for the new page. So memorization is important uh, but you can also come up with a generic solution like I talked about. Alright. Uh, this is good. After you are done with this particular thing make sure you comment out this log again because it's going to impact some of the numbers that we are going to compute in the next few rounds. Let's move on. Okay, so this is now my favorite part. The next five things are going to be about scroll FPS and not times. Uh, by the way, most of the things that I showed before this, we shipped in Shopify Mobile and we saw like significant impact to load time and responsiveness of the app. Um, every change there yielded at least you know 30 to 50 percent improvement and we went down from almost 900 milliseconds to like somewhere in 200 for median load times in production from cache, not network. Uh, because most of the things in Shopify mobile admin load from cache first and then refresh from network. So it's uh, the app heals a lot faster because of the optimization. Next few things are going to be about scroll optimization and I'm going to be talking about how you can use flash lists to significantly improve how uh, scroll experience is. So what I want everyone to do now is from, from this point onwards, uh, once you make the change, after every change you will press the run benchmark button again and capture the new numbers and put them in the sheets that I shared in the beginning. So to get started what you can do right now, I think a lot of you have already uh, computed a baseline. If you haven't, uh, actually, we can all just, you know, load sample up until this point. Do click on run benchmark, wait for it to finish. And the number that you get, you just go and put it in this column next to your name. Because uh, I don't want to be unfair to flag lists. We didn't memoize our tweet cell component. Uh, so these, the numbers should look better, uh, even for flag lists. So you can, either you can open this mag directly if you want not able to finish the rest of the job, or you can just memoize to each cell, tap, run benchmark again, get a new number and just put it here. Once you are done, we'll uh, continue with the rest of the job. All right, so I'm gonna do it right now. Uh, let me hit run benchmark. See, it's already a little bit better compared to the last time. So I 
my god the average number is 1.3 on moto g that's pretty bad <laughs> and of course you can do a few things to make it better but that that's what you get by default all the iphone users are going to get good numbers <laughs> of time I'm going to get started. So let's see what the first task is. So the first one is about uh, making the perf baseline which we already have already done. And then we, if you remember we have two flat lists, one vertical and horizontal. What we are going to do, we will migrate these lists to flash lists. So flash lists is already added to the package.json so you don't have to do that. You don't have to make a lot of changes actually. You just have to import flash list and just rename flash list to flash list. Uh, because the APIs are exactly the same. Right? And that was one of the key goals of flash list making migration super easy. So I'm going to get started on that. So first, I will go to Twitter and change this to flashless. I think it should already be imported. Uh, yes, it was. So I just literally changed the name, nothing else. And I don't need initial not to render anymore. Flashless does not require initial not to render. It requires something else, which I'm going to talk about later. So this is the first one. The second one is inside tweet cell. Uh, Within tweet cell, you will encounter another flash list on line number 54, and we're going to change that to flash list. It's not imported in this file. So the auto suggest gives a wrong path most of the time. So, what I would suggest is just go and copy the import statement from uh, Twitter and just paste it in tweet cell import flash list from at Shopify slash flash list and yes we are good to go Just be 
once you get to this state, you would notice that you have two warnings in your logs. One warning is for the vertical list, the other one is for the horizontal list. So I'm not sure which is which, but I guess we will see. So the first one says estimated item size flash list prop is not defined based on current configuration. You can set it to 268. This is what we talked about in the beginning with initial number to render prop. This is flash list equivalent of that, but it actually gives you a number which is independent, which is dependent on the screen size. So it's going to figure out what its size is and use this value to figure out how many items it should start with. It will also use this number to figure out as you're scrolling how many items it should create or recycle, stuff like that. So it's a very important prop to set, but it's very easy to do because you have it as a given in your warnings. So let's do that. We will take the first one, estimated item size, go to our first flash list inside Twitter, and I'm going to set this one to uh, 268. are done with this exercise, hit the run benchmark button again, get the new average JS FPS and go back to the sheet and put it there. So I'm going to do the same. Let me hit run benchmark. All blank. Okay. So my new number is 11. Let's move on. 
on to the next one. This is a simple one. Flash list. Uh, the core idea of flash list is inside, instead of destroying elements and recreating them, it tries to recycle them. So what we want to minimize as the next uh, optimization is to reduce the number of components that are being destroyed. So what we'll do is we will observe how many of our components are actually getting destroyed and then we will progressively minimize that. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, to observe amounts, we will use user tracks and we'll return a cleanup callback which prints to itself. Now this is a pretty standard way of tracking amounts. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with it. Let me go and add it. So we want to track tweet cell and tweet content code. So we use refresh. Starts from line number 71 inside its own file and import user text again. Call it tweet content amount. Make sure you do it inside tweet cell and tweet content both. Uh, I'll go back, call it tweet 12 now, save and reload. Once you have set both of these, reload, hit the run benchmark button again, and we will capture the number the same we did, we did before. We don't expect anything to change. These console.logs may actually decrease the performance a little bit, but you're gonna see in your logs that a lot of things are getting destroyed. Uh, and they shouldn't be. All right, let's see. Run benchmark. All right, look. Uh, tweet cell. Content are constantly getting unmounted, right? And these are all wasted resources in a way because we could easily take a React component on the screen, fill it with new content, and save all this extra work, right? So my average JS FPS is now around 15.5. Uh, could be just margin of error. can do the same. Just put these logs, run again, get your new number and add it to Anybody having any issues? All right. Let's see. I think most of you are closed. I mean, this 
one is in Jana change a lot because we have done no optimization, just adding logs. So if you have not finished, you can just put the same number that's okay. So realistically, you don't expect any changes. Uh, so task 7 should be understood. Okay, let's move to task 7. If you have not finished until this point, just put the same number in the task 6 column because there's going to be no performance change. All right, so task seven is about the key prop. Uh, so what how many of you are familiar with this prop and how it works? All right, I'm sure like we all have seen that warning, right? Uh, whenever we <laughs> use the doc. <laughs> so what, what, what we have done in this sample on uh, uh, each sweet cell, Every item has a unique ID, and we specify that ID on an item because it is an iteration at the end of the day. Uh, but this key is tied to the item. Uh, but technically, even when we are using flash list, when flash list tries to reuse a cell, we change its key. And whenever you change a key in React, React is going to destroy the JS side of things and the native component as well. So it gets completely destroyed and recreated as new. While in flashes, we don't want that to happen. Now having a, an explicit key is very useful in a list, especially when you are reordering things, because React can actually keep what remains in the list and create new instances for anything that's being added. So addition and removal is better, but in, in a list like flash list where you want the same cell to be reused for new data, it's actually a problem. So what we want to do is, uh, we want to just remove this key in from our render item. So let's do that. Uh, we will go to, again, Twitter. Uh, on line number 39, you see there's a key defined. What I'm gonna do is I will simply get rid of that. And by the way, this key might not just be at render item level. It can be anywhere inside your component. Right? Say you have component one which renders component two. If your component two has a key inside of it, you're constantly destroying things. So when you do your migration to flash list, it's important that you go and look at each of your component, even if they are nested, and see if you have <coughs> any of these keys defined, and if you have, just get rid of them, and you will see significant improvement in performance. So just try and look for, there is one more key somewhere in this sample uh, that you want to get rid of. So let me look at sweet cell. Okay, there is no key here, so we are good. What about sweet content? Okay, I see one key. And I am pretty sure if you go back and look at your code bases, you would find keys in places where they are not really required. Like, what's the point of having key on this view? But it's just there. Right? So I will get rid of it. What this means is even if sweet content is not getting destroyed, this view and all of its children would be destroyed and recreated again and again. So let's remove this as well going to go back, change the version, save and reload, uh, and then we will run another benchmark, any folks can do the same. Okay. I expect good results out of this, let's see, okay, uh, V13 has loaded. Let me hit. You would also observe that sweet cell will no longer unmount in the same frequency, but sweet content might still be unmounted. Let's see. Let me hit run benchmark. Okay, there is no tweet cell unmount at all at this point, but sweet content is still getting destroyed. We'll find out. finish. I'm at 19.3 at this point. All right. 19.3. iPhone users are already at 60. So, <laughs> sorry about that. 
See, this is the point, right? When you see these fancy samples working well on iOS, it doesn't really mean anything. Because <laughs> <laughs> you cannot recreate the same thing on Android. Mid-range Android devices are cheap on the operating time. Do that, do there is no point. All right. Give you one more minute to <coughs> do this, and then we move on to the next one. We have three more. Let's look at task number eight. What is it? Oh, yeah, this is a mistake. So, are there any bugs in the sample at this point? Has anybody noticed? Let's take a look. we have this logic where I can select uh, one of the horizontal tweets and it's going to be changing the primary tweet. Uh, we have a state which keeps track of the current tweet and this is what gets displayed as the primary tweet. Uh, but when we re-render this component, we never update this state at all. Right? So current tweet once set will always be current tweet. So that's why the item is not updated. So how do we fix that? Uh, we can fix that. Uh, I've not written it at this point, but uh, it's it's pretty similar to what we are doing here. And this is, I think, if you have uh, experienced something like this in component updates, you know, uh, this is a very straightforward way of doing it. Like you can write a use effect, and if your current tweet is not equal to tweet, tweet is the one that splash list is sending, and current tweet is what the component has, we will call set current tweet again, and we will set it to tweet. And we have to run it every time tweet changes. see if the issue disappears. Anybody see a problem with this approach? Okay, we'll, we'll get to it later, but, but there is an optimization that you can also use here. Uh, but this is usually how most people do it, but there is a drawback. So yeah, I don't see any repeats anymore. This is good. All right, problem solved. So once you are done with this, hit the run benchmark button again. Where did my premium label go? I wonder if this is the wrong way. Where is it possible? I'll just reload just in case.
five is back, so we have the latest code. I will click on benchmark. We hope you can do the same. Tweet content, of course, will still continue to run on. We'll address that soon. Seven point nine. It has dropped for me at least. Right. Because we are doing two renders. So <coughs> okay. I'm glad a lot of you have been able to follow along till now.
going to do is it's going to re-render the same component twice, but it's not going to re-render the children too. The chil the chi on the children component will only re-render one time. So you save a lot of copy uh, in that way. So create a ref, uh, store the tweet in it initially, and if the source tweet ref's value is not equal to the tweet, you just call, you set the ref, and you call set state in mind. All right? That's one change. In the interest of the time, I'm going to just do the other one as well. Um, so if you look at a horizontal list, right? So flash list has a prop called draw distance based on which you can decide how how much buffer it should maintain. But for a horizontal list, this buffer does not make a lot of sense, right? Like why do you need a big buffer? Or even like flash list only has 250 pixels buffer. But when you're recycling quickly, you can even reduce that buffer to get some more performance out of it. And it's very easy to do. You can go to tweet cell and you can set like draw distance to zero.
you would still get the load time benefit. Uh, but yes, you can technically configure flat list right and get the same performance because if you are not recycling, then even flash list, if there's constant <coughs> mismatch, it will also destroy the element, right, to conserve memory. Um, but yeah, but it's much easier to get good load times with flash list because you have estimated item size instead of initial one to render. So that could be one thing that you can do. And flash list also memoizes a lot of things automatically internally. So you will most likely not run into those issues as well. Like everything is automatically memoized. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, anyone else? Uh, you said earlier that flash list might not be a good solution if you have a list that's like being reordered the often, mm -hmm. you know, being sorted. Um, why is that? I meant React Heap, uh, but Flash List, you can provide a, a key extractor to Flash List as well. If you do that, then that problem is effectively solved. Uh, so it's still better than Flat List. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so there is no, what I meant there was, um, when you are recycling, right, in, in terms of recycling, technically you are not adding or removing items, you are moving one item <coughs> You're converting one item to another, right? In that case, if you keep the key same, React is going to update the same item. What I what I said there had nothing to do with how Flash List handles reordering, so they are unrelated in a way. To answer your question, like simply, like there is no drawback. Uh, like even if you are reordering items, Flash List is going to do a lot better than Flash List uh, because because of that tiny draw distance. Now let's say thousand thousand pixel tall device. Uh, flat list draw distance is going to be how much? Ten thousand pixels, right? And when you are reordering, all of that has to update. Compared to that, flat list draw distance is just two fifty pixels. So imagine ten thousand to two fifty, because it can do updates very quickly. So it, it's actually going to help with the reordering. But you need a key extract. All right. Cool. Thank you so much, folks. Then we can take over. Yeah, let's um, yeah, take like a 10-minute break, and we'll be back. I'm sure all of you uh, might need it.
everybody was able to copy it down and see the repo? Yeah. yeah. So what we should get is uh, something that looks like this. So yeah, uh, we'll get started in a couple minutes, but um, I don't think this will take uh, over an hour. Uh, I think the last one is uh, pretty hard to top. Performance is always like the fun part. You always see like get that high when you see things working faster, and you get to brag about it. Uh, testing is not so much one of those. It's kind of something you have to do. Um, and uh, some organizations believe in it a lot. Other ones don't. Uh, at Shopify, I'd say we're big, big believers at, uh, in testing. Um, we don't have QA teams uh, like some companies. And uh, coming from a background that you realize that this is a gigantic app and everybody's just testing and writing their own tests and doing their own manual testing. So what I want to kind of get out of this is just to show you kind of like how to kind of write a few tests that can um, I know I talked it up with building high quality React apps, and that's just uh, clickbait essentially. But um, <laughs> this is just to get you kind of uh, uh, familiar with how you do some testing, and kind of like a show of hands, like who writes unit tests here, like regularly for a company? Yeah. Uh, who does it? Who doesn't write unit tests? Okay. So do your companies just like not have unit tests at all, or how does it work? <laughs> so no unit tests. Okay. Okay. Um, do you find that does it? The people that, that use unit tests, do you use just usually? Yeah, generally speaking. All right, do you write end-to-end -end tests like Cypress? Okay, yeah. So this is not really about that. Um, this is just handling like the unit test portion. Uh, Cypress is uh, interesting because it depends on how your setup is and how easy it is to simulate that. In Shopify, we have an endless amount of services that all connect with each other, like you can imagine. The couple thousand developers writing all this code. And um, the easiest thing that you can do is at least make sure that your unit of code is working. So I tried to tailor this to like very different audiences. So some of you who are maybe more advanced might not, uh, will, will find this very easy. Other people might find it uh, you know, difficult. So I sh I'm trying to find the in-between there. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, who I am, let's go here. My name is Hussein Kayun. Staff that at Shopify, feel free to connect with me here. Uh, mostly working on front end things for a year and a half. I'm on the Shopify admin team specifically. I work with marketing and building an automation tool that uses a, a service we have called Flow. And uh, currently, I've been on three teams. So, and, and generally, it's been across the same code base. So, I'm pretty familiar with how we test. So, has everybody gotten this working? Okay. Now. Uh, do you have any issues? Or do you, you want to follow along? Or what's yeah. up? Yeah. If you are unable to get it working, it's still OK. I provide some detailed instructions that you can go and follow along when you get the setup working. I feel that uh, yeah, some people usually end up following, some don't. I think you could benefit in either case. So what do we have here? So this is actually built with Polaris. Um, I'm not sure the audience, like, have you heard of this? Polaris is. So this is Shopify's uh, uh, essentially equivalent to material you want. So it's just a design frame. So this is what we use day to day uh, in the Shopify admin. And it's actually open source. Anybody can use it. We have some uh, pretty good docs, I would say, about this. Uh, not related to testing, but just how the components work themselves, similar to material you want. And what I wanted to show you today is a very simple example. Like, there's not a lot that's actually built in here. You can see, like, uh, it's a very simple table. 
Um, this opens a modal. There's a delete button. You can delete one of the items, right? You can add something here if you want. So I'll just add uh, myself here. Again, nothing too fancy. Can add that in. We can filter, very simple filter. And then if you try to delete a primary item, I just added a, a very unique case. So you can, see, you can see there's not a lot of stuff here, but I think we can learn a lot from you know, from testing these about a general, generally how we can test and how we can get things set up. So if we look at the code base that I've given you, and what I've done here are my VS code. And let me know if you can't see stuff. I know it's kind of hard to fit all this in. I tried zooming out and it wasn't like the best. But I've got like three terminals here set up. I got just basic, uh, you know, bash here. I compiled using yarn start. And I have also just ran the test cases. You can, you can on a separate terminal window, just run yarn start, or sorry, yarn uh, space test. And if you want to run the test cases, you just press the letter A. And it'll run all test cases. So I have a very simple uh, setup here. But let me run you through quickly in case you're interested in the setup, how this all works. Okay. Because uh, one challenging thing with these kind of workshops is I can the setup at your company might be very complex. But the setup to get it done on your own might be a little hard. And some of you might have to do that yourselves at your company if you're setting up testing. Um, generally speaking, it's fairly simple if you have the right configuration files. I think the most important one here is you'll see we have something called Mount with Polaris. Now, what is Mount with Polaris? It's based on this um, mount that is provided by Shopify React Testing. So I'm not only plugging Polaris for all of you, I'm actually plugging uh, our testing framework. And the reason is I just want to show you how we do it. Generally speaking, you can find these matchers and, and uh, you can use React testing, uh, the regular library, just as, uh, just as you like. And a lot of this stuff is very similar, but um, we have our open source library here. And uh, essentially what it provides is some custom matchers that we use. So matchers are how you test your expect uh, or, or assertions. You can have things like uh, expect something to have a React prop, expect something to have a specific component. And these are helpful once you provide certain actions, like you saw me in the application, you know, if I go and click on the delete button, I'm a user clicking on the delete button. Now, now I've opened a modal. Is it there? If I click cancel, is it not there anymore? When I click delete, does this row actually go away? Right. So what's important in in, in, your, in my um, or in the testing philosophy at Shopify is that we want to make these tests simple, and we want to test like how a user uses it as much as we can. Sometimes you just can't really do that. You'll have to mock. You'll have to do things that maybe are not how the user is using them, but you want to get to as close to it as possible. And these kind of unit tests are the first layer of defense, uh, I call them. Because if you think about like a, like a, pre uh, like a pyramid, let's say, uh, unit testing is at the bottom of it. You should have a lot of unit tests. And then as you go up, then you have more your Cypress tests. Then you can have more integration tests. And they get, usually those aren't as much. And there are complications to that. I mean, um, some companies have uh, QA people end up writing those uh, Cypress tests for them or very complex integration tests. Um, and we're talking about here just that base layer of unit tests. And again, we want it to be as useful as possible. We want them to be isolated, to run in isolation. We don't want gigantic unit tests. We want to adopt this philosophy of like, we want to set things up. We want to do a certain action, and then we want to assert, right? Just like we said here. We want, you know, there's probably a certain setup to get these, um, uh, you know, this information here, this data here. And then what you want to do is, you know, perform an action, like delete something, and then you want to see did it actually work, right? This is the smallest unit of testing. So going back to the test file that we have, you saw that we have something called Malware Polaris that I showed you that is essentially just mimicking uh, your component rendering, right? And then we store it in this wrapper variable, and that's when we can do our, um, our assertions. In this case here, there's a Polaris component called cage. And this is a very simple test. Normally, I would argue that it's like not even that useful, right? But sometimes it's good to have 
some test in there. And sometimes you have to tell yourself or ask yourself, like, is this actually useful? Is it doing anything, right? Like, the page component is there, that's good. Because maybe something useful is, maybe if the page component shows up conditionally, only if you do something, that might be a little more useful because that's something the user expects. Still, some might argue, and again, these are just my philosophies and trouble my philosophies about how to do something like that. Some people might say, no, this is actually important. And we need to do some, uh, it could be the first test case, just in case this changes. We want people to know like this is important. But we want to go through now the list. And uh, what I'm going to do is start adding uh, a, a few things as we go through. But let me just start by talking about this component. So this is our app component here. How does this look like? So I like to usually look at the render or the return first to give me a good idea. You can see here, here's the page component. What is the page component? It's essentially just giving you this wrapper around the page and giving you like certain um, uh, width or size to work with. It also allows you to add some actions. So I have here the uh, new customer action and I have like an explorer. This just opens up the link, that's it. And then inside of here, I do have that conditional banner that we're showing. And then we also have this customer list component, which is right here, which has that filter. And then there's a simple footer. And I've added inside here the modal component, which you can add outside the page if you want. Um, you, certain people agree doing it this way, some people don't. But this essentially is the modal over here. Now, you might say there's the items provider. Uh, now, are all of you familiar with Shop of the React context? Uh, any, anybody not familiar with it? Perfect. Okay, so this context variable is, uh, this context here is essentially just giving us this data through a hook. So I have this hook called use items, and um, I know I promised to use GraphQL, but I wasn't able to get it working exactly that I wanted, so we're just gonna mock the data for now for all intents and purposes. If you do wanna talk about mocking GraphQL after, please do talk to me. I can show you more specific examples, but nothing working here. So this just has our data, and this hook just provides two things. You can allows you to add an item easily and remove an item. Now you don't need this. Uh, you can do it through your state, or just normal use state or React state, but uh, this is to show you as well how to test the hook. Any questions on that so far? Any confusion? Good, all right. So if you wanna follow along, again, the first thing we did was run our first test um, that we had, and now what we're looking at doing is testing the link on the footer. So this is actually a very simple link component. It's essentially a wrapper on the href that gives you the ability to add a listener to it. It looks something like this. Right here with the link. So this is provided by Polaris, and I'm adding a URL here. So what I'm doing here is a very simple uh, test case. And if I copy it over and I'm following along just like all of you, I can just simply add it right here. And let's see my test cases here. Let's see, now I have a second one happening. So what did I do here? Now you, you see that I have the wrapper like the previous one, but now I have the ability to find something. So this is actually searching through the tree and searching for a specific component called footer helper which is also provided by Polaris. Once I have that footer, I can look inside of it again and look for the link component. And specifically, this is a very basic test case where I'm just looking for a specific prop, which sometimes you just want to do. And this, um, you know, you might, you might say something here where, and it's a fair point where, like, this is a user isn't looking for a prop, a user is looking for a link. But sometimes you have to ask yourself, well, if this is how an href is expected to work, why am, I, why am I testing how hrefs work? So that's a fair point as well. That's why I wanted to add that here because um, if you, you might get something on your code reviews where somebody says, well, this is not a real test. You might say, well, you know, why should I test something that's internal to how something works, right? So, and that's always a debate we're always having and we're trying to figure out. Again, what's useful, don't test for the sake of testing. But if we do wanna do, you know, go a little bit deeper on this, let's look at the case um, where we're opening a new window. In this case, uh, we're clicking the Explore button, it's opening a new window and then generating a link. So you can do something along these lines here. So I'll copy this over to make sure it still works. 
my nightmare is that like I write something in the instructions and it doesn't work and I spent like 10 minutes debugging it here. Okay, so I try to make sure that everything works. And in this case, you see something a little bit different. So in this case, it says open link a new window when clicking on a secondary on secondary actions. Okay, or a secondary action. So in this case, we're mocking the window object, specifically the open part. And we're trying to see that we are actually calling a specific function. So basically what's happening here is window.open uh, has a specific way of working. We don't want to test that. We just want to test that this is, you know, opening a new tab is done through window.open, right, on the web. And this basically simulates saying that that function has been called, and that's all we want. We don't want to see, we don't want to see it through. Another approach here that I couldn't really show you, because I didn't get the setup done, is if you're using React Router, um, you can actually, and you're doing the redirecting using that, you can actually plug into React Router and ask it, like, did the redirection happen? If you have the specific context set up in your use case. Okay, so that's like a third way you can do it that I didn't show it here, but this is like, uh, just a very simple way of testing links to just make sure that, just making sure that, okay, basic things are working. Any questions so far? Yeah? Um, yeah, like as far as it, uh, like internal links, like Shopify's internal links. Yeah, Shopify's internal links, like maybe we have um, uh, more of uh, somewhere li li like uh, constants, where we say like, okay, this specific link versus like hard coding them in, because maybe you don't want to do that. You could say like, give me the specific part of the admin page. Uh, that was uh, I would say is like the main difference between them, because um, in terms of like links. Some of them might have authentication things that you might have to mock. So there's that uh, extra layer. So I guess there's those two differences. But mo mostly we just have a huge file where we want to make sure that um, you're not hard coding them in. And that's probably somebody might, it might be a fair point. Like this might be, because uh, technically it's a Shopify link. Somebody might say to me in a code review, like, hey, why are you hard coding this? Is that good? Awesome. Okay. So let's move forward here. So now we want to look at testing the mobile, right? Um, uh, are you are you all like fans of uh, of using modals? Is, any, is anybody against them? Yeah, it's pretty like you know you could overuse them, I would say, or you could use them where they're not supposed to be used. Like one of my favorite things is people using modals where they take up the entire page, and, you, and it's like why is it this a page? And you're like, well, it needs to be a modal because of a specific use case with mobile, yada yada. So, um, but what we're testing here is just basically. If if this opens here. And this is a very tricky one, and I kind of don't like it, but sometimes, um, you know, you have to, um, I guess, trust the process. And here's what I mean. So if we add this modal test here, let's see if it works, okay? Uh, essentially, uh, what I'm doing here is triggering a click. And now you see this thing called trigger key path. And I think it was, um, is it here as well? Trigger key path, like what does this do? Trigger key path, you can see there's actually a path to clicking. Because you can like maybe click just um, one part of the page, but a primary action is actually an object in Shopify. Mm -hmm. So uh, a trigger key path essentially allows you to go down the chain. And it's, it's especially useful when you have like a drop down menu and you're clicking like the first part and there's like four things. And then you can choose and say, Give, like I want to click on the fourth thing. So that's when the trigger key path uh, becomes useful. And in this case, you can see that all we're doing is checking if uh, the model the modal is open by checking its prop. Now that's a little bit annoying because a modal is always technically like rendered, unless you conditionally render it, like the modal is always there, and opening it just essentially is passing down a state. So that's the part I don't really like. Um, one way around this is if you have like async modals, and what these are is um, you could use, we have like React Async, which essentially doesn't load the modal at all until it, the state actually gets invoked. And that way it doesn't actually exist on the page at all. So that's just another way of doing it where it actually is not rendered yet and then it only gets rendered when it's open. But generally speaking, I think when people use modals, they're already rendered and just the prop changes. So in this case, we're checking that it just has the React prop. And you'll see here that if I actually don't click on it, 
the test case is going to fail. And it's going to tell me that open is false. And that's another way you might want to test, like uh, if you're very familiar, if you were very like a big proponent of TBD, which I think is great, you might want to consider having things fail first and then having them uh, go green. Does anybody actually do that here at, at their work? Like full TBD? <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's one of those things like I don't like to be forced to do it. But when I you know when I do it, I do it like kind of like on my own time, depending on how the scenario fits. It's kind of like pair programming. There's some companies that force you to pair program. Like I've seen ones I, I know my friend worked at one called Pivotal Labs where it was just one laptop for two developers all day every day. Right? So I can't I, you can imagine how, how old that gets. Um, at Shopify, it's a little bit, I, I like it a bit better. I don't know what you thought. Like, it's kind of like a big part of our culture. We have the regular remote tools, and we pair a lot, but it's kind of like sometimes you're like, okay, this is two hours of pairing is a lot. I just need my own time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go relax. So that's a little tangent for you there. Um, anyways, now we have the modal working. Um, but now we want to do something very specific. We want to check that the modal is actually gets closed when you click on close. So this is another user action that might happen. You click on this, and then you say cancel. You click on this, and then you press close. So how do we do this? Let's copy over the test case, and I think I've added both of them here. Let's open that green. Oh, yeah. OK. So there's two ways here. You can see I've actually done it through the secondary action. And the secondary action is actually an array. But this shows you, again, how trigger key path is useful because it's allowing you to click on the first secondary action. If this was uh, a list, you can go through and click on the specific one on the list. So, but one, one thing you notice here is, is a wrapper.act. Does anybody know what the act does? Or heard of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can anybody tell me? Uh, basically, it's, um, you can think of it like as an added layer of protection. Sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. This is to prevent cases where you're actually waiting for something in the UI to finish. So it's very useful if there's an action to wrap it in a wrapper.act. Essentially, um, you don't even need to add a wait. And it'll wait until this is done before it does the expect. Because sometimes there might be specific cases, especially when you're mocking, where if you don't use act, it, it'll say, like, well, you didn't actually open the mode. And these are actually, like, the only part about this is it's so hard to be because you're just like, why is it not open again? I know I put it there. What's going on? Like, how do you actually go and debug it? So act could, could uh, and this, this one we have uh, kind of out of the box in, in, in Polaris, or sorry, React Testing Library for Shopify. But I know they exist on a lot of things, like I'll show you render hook, they have their own as well. So it's actually a very useful tool. You'll see me use it here. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You actually, a lot of times you don't need to do it here, but I just thought I'd point that out. The other thing here is you see me, um, you know, Triggering a close in two ways. So in this way, it, the first way is clicking the cancel button, which again, we have this concept of primary and secondary actions. Um, in Polaris, a primary action is the main green button. The secondary action is a list of other things that you want to do in a model or in any kind of action scenario. It's very nice to have kind of like a design system where things are consistent, especially when the you know, designer can give you something like, this is the primary action, this is the secondary action. I know I've worked at startups before this a lot in the last 10 years and you know one designer would give you you know open close here and the other one would give you the other one on the other side and then you're like how is this happening so this kind of prevents that which I like so again this is not doing anything fancy again just making sure that it's closed and that the react prop change okay. any questions so far yes uh, the back first so I'm wondering your test
because I know in like the overwhelming majority of the cases it's going to be okay based on how we test, right? But you but you bring up a valid point, and if it needs to be tested, it needs to be tested. And and again, this brings up another good point: is that like these aren't there aren't really like a replacement for actual uh, manual testing, and I feel like a developer should have to do that on their code. In fact, if you're code reviewing, it's a good idea if you're a front end developer to check up on that, right? A lot of times we get very um, kind of bogged down, like I know this is a very powerful laptop that Shopify gave me. You know, you have very good internet. I'm using Chrome. Is that the right way to test things, right? Um, I've had an issue where somebody just had really slow internet, and it caused a very specific issue. I gave a talk on that in React Berlin, and that made me realize, okay, like I need to be CPU throttling, and I need to be, um, you know, uh, internet throttling. And I need to be testing on different uh, browsers. And if you don't have a QA team, the responsibility is really on you. So you might have to go in and, and do the extra mile if you can't test it uh, through the specific use cases like you said. But what we're gonna go through next is testing the specific model too. Um, and looking inside of it and making sure that the parts inside the model are okay, but we're not doing it in the context of the model being open. Uh, another, another question? Yeah, so if you're testing the close button action there, is there a similar path that you can target for clicking just outside of the bubble to close it as well? Yes, yes. Um, I didn't write it here, but it's uh, that's a, a very unique problem that um, essentially there's this method to click outside. You could, um, I, I would say, I can't remember the exact article name, but I, I looked at it and it's like essentially looking at how you can click outside through a hook and simulating that through a hook, and then uh, you can test that hook itself. That's one way that I've been able to do it, right? But in this specific uh, scenario, no, like it's, it's a little bit harder to do without having uh, that specific hook. Uh, I think we call it like click outside and seeing how that works because there's specific things that happen when you click outside. Like we had this issue where, and I think it actually exists here, where if you click on it, there's three dots here, for example. Let me see here. And you click on this and then you click on this, see how they're both there, mm. right? Because uh, we're not using this, this is called a resource list, we're not using it as much, but this is a specific bug where you see like when I open, when I open the, this one, the other one should have closed. So how does it know that I actually clicked outside of it to close it? So that hook can solve that problem. Um, okay, so let's uh, look at testing this specific um, uh, create customer model itself. Let's just take a look at it real quick. Um, it actually uses something called React Form, which is again, a Shopify uh, open source library that we have. It works like typically like how a lot of these React Form uh, libraries work. Uh, essentially just streamline, instead of you creating a state for every single uh, part of your form, say you have a form with like 50 things on it, you don't want to have to create a state for every single one. Uh, the valid you usually have to do validation for every single one. So these kind of libraries just end up solving that kind of problem. So you see something like, in this case, it's a hook, and it provides you with certain things that you can do. In this case, like, um, it's asserting that, like, you know, if you don't put in something, it's going to tell you there's an error. Um, it also allows you to do, like, a, a specific submit success or submit error. So that's like, I think that's very uh, common with these kind of libraries, with the React form. But what I wanna do here is actually test like this form is actually working as a user would use it. So let's go ahead here, if you haven't already, we're gonna make a new file called create custom customer modal.test.dsx, okay? So you just need to create that in the same directory as this one. Let's go ahead and copy this over. So if we take a look at this test, it's actually not testing that much. Like it's, uh, this test is like one of those basic ones where again, like, do we need to do this? And you have to ask yourself. Um, some, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no. Because you're looking at certain things like, uh, okay, well, create a new customer might be important. Uh, now, we use kind of like translation, so typically we want to hard code uh, a specific text at Shopify, and we would actually show the call a translation function, and because uh, it could be in specific languages, and that would actually give us the the, the right uh, the right text. Because like if you have it here, and if you change it in the other one, it could be a little bit more annoying. Uh, the other thing here is we can look at the button itself. You can say that um, it should be disabled from the beginning. Uh, the way I made it here was so that uh, you can't click create until you uh, actually fill out the form. So that's the one thing that we want to actually test here. So
So in terms of filling out the form, what we need to simulate is actually the on change and adding text and viewing that to both fields and then making sure that the, dis that the disabled button goes away. So if we go back to our tests, we can add this in from the same file. And what's happening here? Again, um, we're using the act, and I'm separating them here because they're two separate actions. We're essentially just triggering an on change on that component, on the text field component. And we're adding a new customer and a new location, and then we're making sure that um, the button is no longer disabled. Very simple first line test here. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, wanted you to notice here is um, the mount component with the items provider. Now, this is like a very annoying thing I find with like context because you might have your context five levels above, and in this use in this test case, it needs that context. So, one thing that you could do is actually just uh, simulate the, the, the provider and just add it on the specific uh, test case. You can do this, like I wouldn't recommend doing this in every file. One thing that could probably could be better is having it maybe in your test helper um, that's specific to, to a specific context. So again, your context might be, in this case, it's on the page level, but uh, we're testing the modal by itself and it still needs that context. So this can help you circumvent that problem. I know that um, I struggled a few times uh, with, this, with this scenario, but essentially it's just a wrapper, nothing fancy with it. Now let's look what else we've got here. So um, this is like, uh, I don't know if we actually need to add these, but this is a good example of um, another matcher to have been called. Okay, so it calls the on close function when the cancel button is clicked. Okay, in this case, um, Maybe you want to make sure that a function is invoked. Maybe the on close here is not that useful, but sometimes you have uh, third party things that need to be called. So maybe you want to mock out another function that you have like on close. So what's good here is you actually want to see that a function has been called, and maybe you want to see that it's been called a certain number of times, um, depending on your scenario. So this is a pretty useful matcher that I wanted to show you. And this exists on the React testing uh, library that we have at Shopify. Now, um, I'm gonna add something here related to uh, testing a hook because as you click on the uh, create, actually you're calling the add item hook, right? And normally how this would work is when you click add items, you might be making a call to actually your server to add items and then either adding it in the UI or you're kind of just like um, uh, doing an optimistic update uh, and just add a UI right away or waiting for the server to finish to do another call to bring it back. So in this case, we want to make sure that our hook is actually being called. So uh, let's see here. So I'm going to add this thing right here. And what this is doing is I'm actually importing the hook. And I'm actually doing a little just, anybody use just.mock here? Yeah. Um, I kind of hate it. It's uh, <laughs> even every time I think that I, I, I figured it out. Every time you're using, like, say this is a default versus uh, a named import, it might give you a lot of trouble. But it's, but again, like I can't deny that it's very useful. Like when you're, especially this is this could be very useful with packages. Say you're using a package and you just want to uh, mock one specific part of the package, so you could do like a require actual and then be very specific. Like I only want to mock this one because my test is only using that one. Uh, so uh, I, I find it, especially with hooks, useful, but with packages, even more useful. I've added just another thing here because what you can do actually in every test case, in this case what I'm doing is I'm mocking the implementation of I items, but what you could do is say you want to mock um, a different part of a, a different part, say there's a remove item, say you want to mock that in another test case. So what you could do is it could be very flexible. It's like one of them I want to mock, the other one I don't want to mock. So it gives you that kind of utility. But you know, one thing is like it's, the documentation is not very clear, I would say. So in this case, what we want to test is calls the on pixel create and on close functions when the create button is clicked. Because um, essentially what we want to do is when you create this, we want to make sure that the hook is invoked. Okay, 
So again, we do the same thing on change on the trigger field on, on the text field, right? In this case, we clicked on the uh, create button, and what we've seen here is that the add items mock has been called at least one time, and then we're doing a specific match on on, uh, on on its return, which is in this case creating a new object, and that it's been on close. Okay, so in this case, we simul we simulated all these scenarios which was uh, adding the item, you know, what it got called with, which could be very useful. So in this case, we not only simulate that it's been called, but what did it get called with, a specific new thing or a specific object, and then we close the mode, right? But again, this is not within the context of the entire app, this is just within the modal itself. So sometimes you might like, and this is I think very tricky, is like, should you test it and put all your files in the main, uh, put all your tests in the main one here? Or should you kind of be very specific to the to the component itself? And that's like a tricky question because like I think the answer is both. You have to know like which ones you have to do. Like do you want to test the actual component and then you want to test the component actually working within the whole environment. And I think both are useful. Useful. Yeah. Exactly, and that's why I think like the right answer is like to have a bit of both. Like, like for example, like this, like testing that the form works is probably a good idea to have it within the mobile file, right? right? But testing that um, when I actually click this and put in information, and something actually shows up here, <coughs> might be a good idea to have in a more upper level test case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, and that's something you'll have to balance between. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you, you might have scenarios where like they're completely different pages, yeah. right? Question then? Yeah, so it kind of sounded like it was a, either integration test, unit test, um, should you test if the unit or should you test how the unit works with the uh, outside component. I was wondering, like, if you have an integration test, how useful is the unit test within said in integration test? I think like they're both useful and that's a good question. Like I think that like unit testing like builds on itself. If you if you have like essentially the 10 units working and then you do the integration test on top of it, you're making sure like very specific part of that integration test is working, which I still think is important. Like it comes down to like almost like the functional level or the basic functional level, I still think is important because in an integration test you can't test everything. But in a unit test, you can't test everything either, right? So I think they both solve like very specific problems. Like you want to see everything. Like in an integration test, I might want to see that like actual API is working. I don't care about it here, right? In fact, like um, I think like sometimes I see that where uh, your whole suite is like not working, and then you go and look at it, and it's like failing randomly. Well, somebody tried to call the actual API in their unit test, and what happens then? Like sometimes the API fails. So you shouldn't. You should be mocking. APIs, and, but you shouldn't be doing that in integration test. You should actually test the API and call them, and in fact, like uh, do many calls to it and simulate maybe different ways of, of calling it. So what Does that make sense? Like a, yeah, um, but I'm trying to wrap my head around like what would be an example where an integration test passes but a unit test fails? Yeah, like uh, in a case where say like you're logging out, um, you have to go to a specific button and then you log out, right? So you want to see that you went through a specific page, right? But say, for example, like a, a specific prop doesn't match. Like in this case, we like this is a dumb example that I just think of on the spot. Maybe the button name was incorrect, right? And maybe the integration test isn't testing for that, right? Okay. Or maybe it's not testing for a specific prop, or maybe um, the integration test could bypass some things that the unit test doesn't, 
right? So think about unit test as being very specific, but integration test is looking at the whole, more of the whole picture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody not agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So okay, we want to test now like a full scenario of the model. So in this case, um, we're going to go back to the app.test.tx, and um, and this is kind of like again very specific, but all, it could be very important. Is when you're opening this up, right? And you close it and you open it up again, that the form fields are reset, so they don't stay there. Again, might not be the most useful thing, but again, I just want to show you that you have that op that, that option here. So let's copy that over. Let's go to the app.tsx. And you can see here that we actually need the text field, and that's an import that's here from Polaris. And what are we checking here? Now um, we're going through the paths again. We're building in these tests, like we're building on everything that we did before, adding the customer name, opening up the action then closing it, and then making sure that when we open it up again, that uh, the values are actually empty. Very simple. Moving on here again, is um, we want to make sure that, um, uh, again here, we want to make sure that we have these imports here. So before you do the next test case, you will need this. now we want to test that an actual item gets created so when you add something that like an actual row shows up so in this case we want to make sure that this row size increased and that's another matter that you just have from Jest that's available to you so let's do that let's add it in so in this case what we did is again open the modal add in some information and then submitted it, and then you can see here that the actual uh, rows increased, right? So if I were, uh, so, so in the mock we had two, you know, if I tried to do one, it'll say, no, you actually have three, I okay. Uh, complaining because I have an empty file here. 
So we're actually testing this with a bit of mock data. Now I, I like mock data here, like I don't like to put it in the same file usually. I like to put it in another file because what I often find is that it's reused. So you can have like, I recommend like factories. Uh, does anybody else use them kind of thing, like factories? Yeah, so you just have like a bunch of them and then um, uh, you might like reuse them or combine them together. So I wouldn't actually recommend this unless you're testing something very simple. Again, like I think oh, what should inform your decision about making a factory is what you're testing. Like, do you, if you say and be dogmatic about these things and say I'm gonna write a factory for every single thing I do, uh, you know, maybe that ends up costing you more time and you didn't actually need to do it. Because it's like, in these cases, like, I always find it hard to predict the future, right? It's like, okay, the future is gonna be like, we're gonna have a lot of these, and then you end up being wrong. And sometimes you end up being right, but then you only remember the times when you were right. So you end up doing them all the time. So just something to be aware of and be careful of is you might not see something that's best practice, but it might be for that specific context, the right thing to do. So in this case, again, um, uh, we have the initial test and just making sure that we have the same length as we have uh, in our call, which is like, um, I think, uh, two bits better. So this is just the basic setup. Uh, what we want to test is this delete functionality. So if you add this in, so we're testing for the delete, and um, what you'll see here is like a little error, and it's actually not passing, so let's see what it says. So it's saying that shortcut actions is not an object, so something, something is going wrong here. Um, oh, one way that you can actually help you debug these kind of issues, and they happen a lot, is I find this tool that uh, we have is very useful. So under this line, I'm gonna add something called debug. So what this is actually gonna give me is, in my test case, it's gonna be giving me an output of the entire tree, which I, I find very useful because in that specific snapshot, like, what is happening? And uh, I'll just tell you right away that the shortcut actions actually exist on the resource item and not the role item, and that's why it's breaking, right? And uh, this might seem obvious now, but a lot of times, what's, what's hard in, in, in when you're manually testing, you see something not working, you can fix it right away. Right, you just like, oh, okay, obviously that's not, I, I can see that. But here it's like, what does the test case see? Right, you don't know what the test case is actually seeing and what it's complaining about. And, and it's frustrating because sometimes you feel like it's working, but the test case isn't seeing it, and I can't submit this without the test case, right? So in this case, that's why having tools like this debug uh, that, that exists gives you an idea about what, how the tree is looking might actually help you solve that problem. So in this case, I was able to see that the shortcut actions actually exist on this component and not the other one. So uh, how I solve that, sorry, is actually by going in and uh, changing, where is that here? I'm gonna do the find, oh, sorry, I'm confused here. I can do this on the uh, resource item, okay? And it should be imported there, and now you see that the test case passed, I'm just gonna remove this console.log. So you saw here, it just gives you an idea about how to go deeper into a test case when you're having problems. So it's not about like you getting the green check marks, right? Well, it is about getting the green check marks, but some, you know, it's about like sometimes how you can you debug these test cases themselves. So in this case, we saw something like by clicking the delete button, we were able to have one less row than the initial items that we had. All right, now testing the search functionality, now, without, uh, without looking at this, like, based on the matches that we've had right now, like, you've seen, like, how would you, in a test case, test this? Like, anybody tell me? Like, what would you simulate to make sure that the actual uh, search functionality is working? What would you do? Any idea? Uh, so, uh, uh, what I want to test now is that, say, when I search Ellen, that I actually see only Ellen. How would you test that in like a, a kind of a test case? Say again? Okay, and what do I have to do before that? Exactly, exactly. So very simple here, and again, everything builds on the last thing. So, uh, and that's what I find with tests is like the first few that you write will take you forever. But then once you have it, it's gonna be easy. And here's one thing that I'm a big, big proponent of. Now that I've shown you these, it's simple. 
But like, say you've learned this and you become the expert, but your colleague is, uh, you know, at, at your job is not. Even though this seems basic right now, if they don't know it, it's gonna take them like two days to do it, to figure it out on their own. And maybe like looking at your test cases maybe, and maybe if they forgot like, oh, that's how you use just.mock versus that's not how you do it, right? It's gonna make a big difference. So what I'm a big proponent of is document these things. And if you're gonna document it, make it into like, uh, I would say a recipe book, right? So now you're saying like how to test that a modal opens, uh, how to test that a modal closes. These could be like good recipes. Right? You're not being very specific, you're giving scenarios. Because like if you're, you know, a lot of apps that we use day to day, like when we build day to day, a lot of them have like the same kind of actions, right? It's like a page, uh, sometimes a table, sometimes a modal, you know, like like generally speaking, like we have a fixed amount of things that unless you have like you're building video games, which I'm not like, or things that are very complicated, a lot of it are these simple interactions, right? Because the last thing you want to end up doing is writing your code takes you a half a day, but writing test takes two days. And that's the trap you can fall into when you don't have like something like a recipe book. All right, so again, like you said over here, you can just, um, again, test that we actually changed it to main and that we actually just got uh, you know one row and that the row actually matched. And then for the search functionality, again, it's the same thing. Uh, sorry, when it's empty. We are searching for something that doesn't exist and then this empty search result is a component we have on uh, Polaris that's easy to use. And then it tells you that this one actually showed up. Okay, so now we've, uh, we've tested this, but we haven't tested our actual hook itself, right? So testing a hook is actually uh, uh, pretty interesting because when you want to test a hook, a hook has to be used within a React component. So you have, the option of like making a fake component and making sure that the hook is working as you intended to do it. Uh, I find that pretty annoying, and that's how it kind of it used to be done. Um, does anybody here use render hook or know about it? Yeah, can you tell, tell us what it's about? Oh, roughly, uh, at least within great testing library, like uh, can call render hook on an existing hook and then create expectations directly of the result that it gets back. Exactly, yeah. So you now don't, you, you can separate what your hook is doing from an actual component, right? Which lets you test what you want to test, which is the functionality of your hook, not how it works within a component, because that's another test. So what we're gonna do here is we have the hook file here, and I'm gonna make a, a test file called uh, use items at test dot, just TypeScript this time, and I'm gonna post this in. And you can see here, I'm not using Shopify's uh, render hook because um, it's not completely open source here, so I'm just using uh, React test, uh, just testing library. And you can see that it gives you the render hook and the app. So how does that work? Um, right here, we have our first uh, test case that adds and removes items correctly. Uh, you can see that whenever I want to use the actual hook, I call render hook with the hook call inside of it with the result. And then on the result, I can actually, you know, make a call to add an item with a new item. So, and that's within the act to kind of make sure that uh, the expect uh, it actually um, pauses when a change is, is happening, or at least that's what's recommended. And you see now that um, uh, the length is increased uh, instead of two, and now we have three items. And again, very useful tool to use. If you're not using render hook, make sure you use it. Uh, because it allows you to isolate things. So you might see here I'm, I'm, I'm hiding the console that errors. This is a mismatch between render hook um, and uh, the React code base that I have here. It's not uh, kind of optimized for React 18, so it might give you a little noise there, so, I, so I've gone and hidden it. So this tests the, um, the add and remove functionality. So uh, nothing too complicated there. Again, just looking for items, making sure that they exist or don't exist. Nothing too fancy. Um, now, uh, for completion here, we can test the delete modal itself and the row item itself. Um, but I think that um, essentially, it's just the same thing as we've done before. Uh, the only difference here is that I'm checking for the is primary uh, and making sure that if something is primary that um, it has an actual batch. But one thing I actually forgot to add here is this specific scenario, right? So let's, I, I think we can write this together um, because I don't have the code for it.
but I think that based on what we learned so far, I think uh, some of you can help me. What do you think? Yeah, okay. So um, in this specific case, it's on, I'm gonna write it in the app that, that, that test that TSX here, so uh, let's see here. So um, how, would you, how would you call this test? I think in this case, like we have a very specific scenario. So I'll say like deletion failed means what? Um, in this case, we're saying when trying to delete a primary customer. But I think yours is also useful because like maybe in the future it doesn't encompass that. And maybe that could change. So that's very actually a very good point I didn't think about is like maybe you should only you're actually testing that and not testing this specific scenario if that does change. Yeah, I'll just add that. I think that's typically what I've seen. I think so as well. Like, uh, it's hard here to say like where should you document your code. Some people say you should doc your, your test cases are your code documentation. Now, that's valid, but like, you want me to read all your test cases to figure out how your code works? Like, again, like my idea of how the code should be documented should be um, the easiest thing that you could like how to make life easier for the next developer, right? So where should that documentation lie? Um, I think sometimes like if it's complicated, it should be its own doc um, attached to the code, or uh, maybe it has its own like in your doc section. You can have specific ways of how your code works. Now, but then there's specific scenarios like maybe uh, maybe here, maybe if you're doing something where I would say uh, the the rule of thumb I follow is don't comment on what the code does, but why it does it. Right, that's within the code itself. Like. I know that this if statement does this, like it's clear to me, right? Don't need to write that down for me, but tell me why it's doing that. Because one of those if statements could be like a very important product decision. Very important product. And, and if the next developer doesn't know that, you know, they remove it, ends up causing a problem. Once they do that, now they know I'm not gonna touch anything. Because I don't know how any of this actually works. Right? And with what, what you wrote with this with this scenario and this scenario, then I think the one of the fall one of the drawbacks of testing and writing code comments is that you have to update them. And when people say they go stale, I think they have a very good point, right? So, but then like the responsibility has to fall somewhere. Somebody has to make these edits, right? And um, it's just, it's harder because they, these things don't fail. I mean, one linting rule that we have usually is if the test case has the exact same name, for us it'll say like, hey, this has the exact same name, change it. But once you change like one letter, it, it won't be, we have also on like the length of the test case, uh, maybe if you write like two words, it won't let you. Um, sometimes we even have more specific ones about like um, writing specific things. You might say like you shouldn't use this word, in, right? And that's all. Uh, th those are all ways that you can like maybe mitigate writing bad test names or at least uh, assertions. We're not assertions, but uh, um, what you write inside this if block itself. So again, like what are we doing? Um, we want to make sure that. When you click the delete button, but only this one, that it actually doesn't work. Okay. And now I'm looking at time, and I do have it ready. But um, let, let, like, what would you do in this case? Well, what's the first step to do in this test case? Yeah. You look for that primary badge. Uh, like, make the user has a primary badge. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we can test that, right? And uh, you know, so so we have to make sure that it's the primary badge, and then. If it's a primary badge, we'll attempt to delete it. And when you delete it, it should show the error. Back. So I do have something like this, and actually, you actually corrected me because uh, I just know, in this case, you might consider it valid, but I think 
what you said is actually more correct, is that um, I'm just checking for, I know the first item doesn't have it. Oh, sorry, I know the first item is a primary, but then again, that might change and somebody changes the box. So what you're saying actually is a way better idea. So I'll opt for that. So in this case, what's happening here, I'm gonna just add this uh, resource item, which is part of the resource list, um, and then the banner. So again, very simple test case, but that's all it is, right? You want to start with a simple line, of like the first line of defense, and write things that could basically go wrong as you write them. And uh, the last thing I'll mention here also that's important, and a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of people gloss over, and it's actually really hard to test, is you see here, like from an accessibility standpoint, if I go here and press cancel, and I press tab, can anybody see what's wrong with that? So again, click this, canceled it, and I'm tabbing. Anybody see anything wrong with that? Exactly, right? So if I'm using a screen reader and I can't see what's actually on the screen, uh, every time I open this and close it, right? if I end up here, imagine how annoying that is. And if you use a screen reader, you know how annoying it, it sounds. Yeah. It's gonna read everything and you have to tab through everything again. So in this case, um, this is a simple fix. You just have to, we have an activator um, a prop that belongs to a mobile, and you can choose to say uh, uh, this button actually activated this part. So I didn't add it in, but I wanted to note that because um, in, in unit testing, this could be very hard. And I think that especially with accessibility, uh, I find it very difficult if you don't do these manual tests with a screen reader to find these kind of issues. Because um, again, like, forget about being sued and stuff like that. Like, you actually want to be a good person, you want to write the stuff to be used by everyone. So um, I think that that's just the point I wanted to, to make more clear with testing. And again, you can't test everything. Everything is a trade-off in engineering. You just have to make sure that what you do test actually matters. And that's it. Yeah. Again, not too long again, and, and not too complex, and that was the whole point, is to make this uh, kind of useful for everyone. Did, did it, did, who found this useful? Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, for GraphQL, should we just like move it outside? Or? Yeah, just come here afterwards. I'll show you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, everything here is uh, it's called uh, React Testing oh. Library. Just sort of Shopify React Testing. It's, it's open source. It's part of our like full package. And uh, a lot of the things that we made open source, including colors.
And yeah, you might not agree, I completely respect that. Thank you again for